Okay, I got shut down, but so this will be part two, um, and you know, but we'll, we'll move on. So anyway, uh, we were talking about mail order brides. These mail order brides would could actually be shipped to these uh, to these men. And why would women want to sell themselves as mail order brides? Well, you know, it sure beat working in the factories uh, in the cities. In some cases, this was it was an act of desperation. Um, anyway. Uh, I wish I could spend more time on just talking about the economic impacts of the uh, of the railroads, but I want to get onto some other things. Uh, we ma I mentioned the catalogs that were selling uh, selling these mail order brides, but these catalogs would also sell other products. Um, it, Sears and Roebuck, for example, uh, or Sears Roebuck and Company, for example, would send out these these catalogs, and people could work instead of going to a store, they could look in the catalog for the things that they wanted. And, um, and then send in their order, and because of the trains, these orders could be shipped to them. Uh, and so the Sears Roebuck would sell just about anything, from guns to shoes to, uh, to top hats to dresses to corsets and whatever it is that you needed and wanted. And, of course, um, uh, I think the railroads contributed to American, uh, it should be American culture. Um, and, of course, uh, for, because of these catalogs and because of these magazines and because of the expansion of mass media, now uh, publishing houses in New York can sell their magazines all over the country, and what they're selling is no longer is not dated. If it takes two months for your publication to get from New York to San Francisco, there's no sense in really publishing that and, and sending that out. But if it takes just a matter of days, well, now you actually have a, a publication. So for the first time in American history, we have a situation where... Um, People in in uh, California could uh, see the the cultural influences of people in New York or in Boston uh, uh, or Savannah, Georgia, and um, and could be uh, could be attracted to the same things and the same kind of influences. So we're starting to see the development of, of an American character, an American culture, uh, and of course this American culture is based on consumerism, the idea that we're selling products um, to make people more beautiful or more handsome or more American. Um, the railroads are actually going to change our concept of time. Uh, for the first time in history, of course, you know, time, telling time was a local thing. You would look up and the sun was halfway through the sky. That was noontime. But now you're running railroads and you can't just come up with what, what it seems to be the time. Uh, there has to be a standard by which time is going to be measured. And because of the railroads and because we have to get these uh, trains running on time and we have to get them to some place which may have a different time, we're actually going to establish standardized time zones. Uh, so that you knew that, it, that if, uh, if a train was supposed to uh, show up at 1 o'clock, it was going to be 1 o'clock within your particular time zone, not 1 o'clock according to New York time. Um, so our entire concept of time and the, the idea of actually being on time, uh, you know, riding in coaches and wagons was kind of risky, risky business. So if somebody, if you had a, a family member who was going to show up in town on a, on a horse and carriage, uh, well, they may not necessarily get there on the date as specified. You know, they may get there in around that time. But the train was expected to be there at a particular time. It had to be. You had multiple trains on, on, on same, same tracks. Um, so we have all of these things going on, and of course, uh, these trains, as they're traveling through the countryside, are going to have to stop. They had to fill up with water. These things were, were water-powered, okay? They, you, you, they were steam engines. Uh, if the water got too low, the, the, uh, the, rail, the train lost power, uh, so they had to water. And where these trains would stop, of course, became places where people could get off the train and stretch their legs and rest. And, of course, it became a place where people could sell their goods. Someone's going to say, hey, this is a great place to put up a sandwich shop or a saloon or a clothing store or whatever. And uh, before you know it, you have the towns popping up or towns growing. Uh, towns that, that the uh, railroads passed by simply dried up, and the people who had lived in those towns were going to have to move to the towns that were closer to the railroad tracks. Um, and also cities. The trains would usually have their hubs in the cities, and the, the trains became a spur for urbanization, which is something we'll talk about a little bit later on. But uh, it, the, the railroads are going to be a major influence in uh, cities growing and becoming huge megalithic uh, uh, entities on the countryside. Um, and we're going to, the United States is going, as a result of the, uh, the railroads, is going to start to develop an industrial uh, culture. These, uh, these cities will become the center of American culture for, uh, in many ways. So, um, 
So not only was this because of economic incentives, because the ind industries were expanding as a result of the railroad, but the railroads also made it easier to get to these cities or to leave these cities and then return to the cities, uh, gaining access to these cities. Also, people who live in the cities are not growing food. Uh, so how do you feed all of these people? Well, railroads. The railroads actually made it possible for people who lived in the cities to get adequate food and nutrition, and that made life in cities actually possible. Um, also, too, again, we, where we talked about Native Americans, we'll talk about them a little bit more later on when we talk about the Indian Wars, but um, the railroads will also put an end to any uh, resistance on the part of Native Americans uh, in maintaining their culture. Uh, the railroads are going to become a huge drive for white settlers to go into Indian territories, and uh, it will also be a means by which soldiers will be brought into these uh, Indian lands, uh, and that will pretty much be the end of, uh, within short order, uh, the end of Indian resistance in the 19th century. Uh, we also see the... Uh, these uh, traveling shows going using the railroads to travel around the world to uh, to represent a mythical uh, you know cultural identity of the American West the most famous of which was Buffalo Bill's uh, Wild West show in which he would have uh, Native Americans and, and cowboys and uh, and sharpshooters and knife throwers and things along those lines would be part of this Wild West rodeo show and, and roundup. And it's, again, it's going to be instrumental in creating the concept of the Wild West and the, the lone cowboy and uh, the uh, the hero-villain kind of, uh, of mystique that we have uh, from our Hollywood concepts of, of the Wild West derives from these shows that traveled all over the country. Uh, and of course, when we talk about uh, Buffalo Bill, uh, we actually have to talk about maybe the real Buffalo Bill. And this touches on the environmental impacts of the railroads. The, uh, the railroads were absolutely devastating to the, uh, to the uh, environments that they, uh, that, they, that they touched. And mostly, this has to do with the real Buffalo Bill. Buffalo Bill Cody. Buffalo Bill Cody worked for the railroads. Uh, and what was his job? Well, uh, during the, the dominant species on the plains, of course, other than human beings, were these guys, the American buffalo, the bison. Uh, and uh, these were huge herds of bison that would travel, uh, you know, by, by the hundreds of thousands or even millions. And if you've got 10,000 bison sitting on your railroad track uh, and you're trying to get your train somewhere, you ain't going nowhere. Um, so um, guys like Buffalo Bill were hired to shoot them. Of course, this was also a bane to the military as well, or a boon to the military as well, because shooting the buffalo uh, was also a way of kind of killing off and putting pressure on Native American tribes like the Sioux uh, to, and, the, and the Comanche to uh, go back, go on to the uh, reservations and take up farming, as these cultures were dependent upon the bison and the traveling herds, and now these, bi these herds were being wiped out and eliminated. But it wasn't just the, uh, the bison herds, it was also the grass, uh, the, um, the prairies, the great, this was known as the Great American Desert. I gotta sneeze. No, no, oh yeah. The, um, the Great American Desert was this vast grassland that had, been, um, that had developed over the span of about 20,000, 30,000 years as the glaciers retreated. Uh, the, uh, the, this was an environment that was held together by this thick, rich um, grass uh, holding down the sod. Of course, one of the first things that the farmers are going to do when they get in there is break all that grass up and get it out of there and, uh, and start farming those um, farming those, uh, those plots. So what we see is the, uh, the replacement of these vast, uh, you know, thick grasslands with farmlands and wheat and, and corn and other, uh, and, and other flora. Uh, we also see the elimination of many of your alpha species, your alpha predators, like the wolves and the mountain lions. Um, bears uh, are going to be pushed out of these uh, these territories. Also, too, not just in the prairies, but the prairies, uh, you know, people are kind of get tired of living in mud houses after a while, but the railroads make it possible for them to get access to wood and to lumber. Uh, so vast swaths of Michigan, Wisconsin, Oregon are going to be denuded of their trees uh, in order to supply wood for the, these new towns that were popping up all over what used to be prairies. Um, 
And then ultimately, the politics of railroad. Railroads are going to change uh, our political, uh, you know, our political ideas. Uh, remember, this was a time where it was believed that the um, that the government should pretty much stay out of business. Uh, it was a the, the dominant philosophy of the time was laissez-faire, uh, hands off. The, the government doesn't regulate business. Business just does what it needs to do to be business. Well, the railroads kind of changed some of that. Um, the railroads accumulate a tremendous tremendous amount of power and therefore they generate a tremendous amount of influence over people's lives to the point where uh, railroad magnet uh, uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt actually at one point exclaims law what do I care about the law hain't I got the power uh, where people are starting to say whoa wait a minute you're getting a little bit too carried away there corny um, there needs to be some checks against your your power and the only institution that's available to do that is the government and of course it looked didn't look good for the government either because um, you know where you have that much wealth you also have political influence and you have corruption for instance the infant Miss Credit Mobilier scandal. This was a case where the Union Pacific Railroad uh, uh, put together a company just off the top of their head called the Credit Mobiliers. This was a construction company. Well, here's what they did. Uh, the Union Pacific Railroad would use government funds to hire the Credit Mobilier construction company, which was themselves, to do construction for the Union Pacific Railroad. And then they would then use that money to pay themselves back huge dividends, huge profits on their uh, on their expenditures as much as over 300 percent profit was being made as a result of this um, once uh, people started looking into this what they would do is they would simply start passing out shares of uh, the credit mobilier company to congressmen so that as congressmen uh, became invested in the profits of the credit mobilier uh, company and then they would be less inclined to want to to uh, look into the affairs of the of this particular company of course newspapers ultimately did break this it became a huge scandal even the vice president of the United States was in on this particular gig uh, wonderful stuff and people get really really upset about the uh, corruptive influences of guys like that uh, you know saying that you know I really did the law doesn't really apply to me well it really needs to apply to you uh, we don't have a monarchy even a monarchy of railroad people um, people were also being railroaded. In other words, they were being charged exorbitant fees to put their uh, goods on the railroads. And, you know, after a while, your company, your business, your farm becomes dependent upon uh, getting your goods to markets far away. And then the railroads can pretty much charge you whatever it is that they wanted. And usually the railroads had local monopolies. They controlled the railroads in a particular region. So uh, you had to pay whatever it was that they, they were asking you to pay. Uh, and people became very upset with that. We'll talk about the grain and we'll talk about the, uh, the populist movement uh, later on, but demands were being placed on the government to do something. And ultimately what's going to happen, um, the states will be the first uh, group to actually try to influence this, uh, but they're going to be smashed by the good old Supreme Court. You can always count on the Supreme Court to stand in the way of human progress. But they rule in what becomes known as the, what was the Wabash St. Louis and Pacific Railroad Company versus Illinois. The Supreme Court ruled that the state of Illinois had no power to regulate what was interstate commerce, that the Constitution uh, you know, gave that power to the federal government. Uh, so the uh, federal government went, all right, well, we'll regulate the railroads. And they uh, come up with what was called the Interstate Commerce Act of 1887, which regulated the railroads and the rates that they could charge to their customers. Uh, it also put into effect the Interstate Commerce Commission to uh, investigate uh, problems and to enforce the law. Now, the Interstate Commerce Com uh, uh, Act was very, very significant. Think about this. This is the first time in American history where there was a blatant move by the federal government to regulate a major business. Uh, and this is a watershed moment in American politics. Uh, it, that is, nothing like this had really ever happened before. Uh, yes, laws have been put into effect to influence and to encourage businesses to, to expand, but never to regulate and tell businesses what they can and cannot do in their business. Um, and this has kind of opened the door to other possibilities uh, coming into the near future and is really going to make us debate uh, the role of government in, uh, in economics and ultimately the role of government in our everyday lives. Uh, and this debate will come to, uh, you know, is uh, something that is still going on. Um, but anyway, this was just a brief, uh, you know, coverage of the, uh, of the railroads. 
And uh, I could probably go into a lot more of this. But for now, take a look at the stuff that we talked about and try to take a look at some of the different themes uh, that AP puts out there. And maybe take a look at some of the other 29 lectures um, and, um, and see where some of these themes fit in with things like the Civil War, Reconstruction, the American Revolution, the American system. Um, but anyway, until, uh, until next time, uh, talk to you later.